We want to welcome you to Midweek Hymns and Bible Study, and we're going to complete a character study based upon the Old Testament character from the book of Judges, Gideon. In the last number of weeks, we've been looking at the life of Gideon. Gideon lived 1,100 years B.C., and we've seen that Gideon is a man that is growing in his faith. We see in the book of Hebrews, New Testament, that Gideon is a man who's described as a man of great faith. And yet when we first see him in Judges chapter 6, Gideon is hiding. He's hiding in a hole, a wine press. He's hiding from the oppressors of the Israelites, the Midianites. And yet he's greeted as a mighty man of valor. And over these weeks, we've seen what God has done in Gideon's life to grow him and to make him into the man that would be described as a mighty man of valor. Well, today we're going to conclude and we're going to need your Bible. So if you have your Bibles... Judges chapter 7 is where we're going to begin. In just a few moments, we're going to see how Gideon leads the people of Israel to accomplish what they would have never been able to dream. But before we do that, Stephen's going to come. He's going to lead us in our hymns for this week. Before he does, let me say a word of prayer. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather, to gather around your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us today at the very point of need that we bring to this study. Would you help us to understand what it means to follow Jesus and to follow him every day all across our lives and what it means to live a life that finishes well. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our worship today, we begin with the hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. We want to crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem. We worship him. So lift your voice as we sing these stanzas. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Join with me. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth our royal diadem. And and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown And crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throne we at his feet may fall, we'll join the everlasting song. And crown him, Lord of all. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name as we focus on the name of Christ. I'm going to sing the great hymn about one of his attributes, man of sorrows. What a name. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's sing together. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruined sinners to reclaim, hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing wound, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, 
what a savior, guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless lamb of God was he, full atonement can it be, hallelujah, what a savior. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished, was his cry. <coughs> Heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring, then a new this song we'll sing, hallelujah, what a Savior. Man of sorrows, what a name to his name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, he's the mighty king, master of everything. The song takes us back. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, may it speak to your heart. Join with me. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty God is he. Bow down before him, love and adore him, his name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. And we find rest and peace and confidence and assurance in the name of Jesus Christ. Trust his name today. God bless you all. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Judges chapter 7. And we're going to see where we picked up last week. And that was that the nation has ready to go to battle against the Midianites. Now, if you remember last week, in the Valley of Jezreel, there were 135,000 Midianites and Amalekites, other tribes from the east that had moved in. It was the season of harvest, and they were staging raids, that, raids that would drive the people of Israel into the caves and cliffs each year to protect what they had to get them until the next harvest. So you have 135,000 staged. We saw last week that he has called for the men of the four tribes that surround the Valley of Jezreel to gather, and 32,000 men have responded to the call. And yet look with me in verse 2. The Lord says to Gideon, You've got too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands. In order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her, announce now to the people, Anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. And what happens is, in the next few verses, is that the numbers are, are reduced. The ranks of these 32,000, they go from 32,000 to 10,000, and finally down to 300. And in verse 7, God says to Gideon, The Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. And what we see in this passage is that the battle had already been won. Before the first blow has ever been thrown, Gideon has won the battle before him. 
and he's going to win it with 300 people. And what we see here is that God knows their hearts, just as God knows our hearts. And God knew the issue with the Israelites was that they had made themselves their own idol. You know, just like their forebearers in the desert had created a golden calf, the children of Israel had an idol. But this time it wasn't a calf. It was a self-portrait. And he knew their hearts well enough to know that even though they were vastly outnumbered, that probably an army of 32,000 might be able to explain away the victory. And God wanted to show them it was him. It was him that was bringing the victory. It was God himself that was their security. And so God challenges Gideon to reduce ranks. And as he does so, 300 men are left. And God says, now, I'm going to save you. I'm going to save you. If you have your Bibles, we're going to now move down to verse 9. And I'm going to read a lot of scripture here. Follow along with me. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, now you get up. Go down against the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. You know what we see right here is that the battle has been won. The battle's been won again before the first blow has been thrown. God, God's won the battle while the men are even still asleep. He says, now if you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they're saying. You know, Gideon, this man who was found hiding in the wine press, has been tentative at times across these weeks, across these pages as we read about his life in the book of Judges. God knows his heart. He says, now, if you need assurance, take your servant, go down to the camp, and you listen, and it's going to encourage you. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley, thick as locusts. Their camels no more counted or able to be counted than the sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend a dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and it collapsed. His friend responded, This can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. Verse 15, And when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped God. He returned to the camp of Israel and he called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. And dividing the three hundred men, he divided them into three companies. He placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them, follow my lead, and when I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. And when I blow, and when I, uh, when I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, you blow yours and you shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men that were with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets, they broke their jars and they were, that were in their hands. And the three companies blew their trumpets and smashed the jars. And grasping the torches in their left hands and holding their right hands, the trumpets they were to blow, they shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran crying out as they fled. And when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. We go on to find out that it was a rout. The 135,000 were defeated by the 300, just as God said. He had said, I'm going to deliver you. Now, as Paul Harvey would say, now is the rest of the story. Because up until this point, Gideon has grown in his faith. And now he has won the battle of battles. I don't know if there's ever been a greater battle won in the history of mankind, he's won this battle. And he's come from rags to riches. And all of a sudden, this man who would be in his early 30s is facing the rest of his life. And what we'll see today is there are three tests that come Gideon's way. The first test is the, the test of popularity. Now look with me in verse 22. In verse 22, it says, The 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men 
throughout the camp to turn each other. And again, it talks about this route, this route. Now, we saw earlier that it was for the Lord they called out, for the Lord and for Gideon. And Gideon becomes an instant pop star. Gideon becomes the one who has thrown off their captors. He is offered a monarchy. They want him to rule over them. In fact, we see as we go through the book of Judges and to Samuel that that becomes a constant refrain. They want to be like the others where they could point to a human being and say, that's our leader. And they offer him that because he represents security. He represents success. He's led with wisdom and courage, and he's been faithful. And they offer him what would a tantamount be, again, the ability to be the king. Now look with me in verse 23 upon their offer. In verse 23, we see that they call out and they offer him this. And, and Gideon in chapter 8, verse 23 says, The Lord shall rule over you. Chapter 8, verse 23, it's the Lord that shall, shall rule over you. And once again, we see that Gideon is demonstrating great humility. He's demonstrating wisdom and courage and leadership. And Gideon reminds them it is God that has brought them to this point. It's God that's delivered them. God's their security. He passed this test. He shows them that their hope, their future rests in the hands of God. God. Look with me, chapter 8, verse 24, because there's a secondary test. It's the test of money and of, of power. Verse 24, Gideon, or verse, let's say verse 23, Gideon tells them, I'm not going to rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And he said, I, I do have one request that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. You know, we see right here that Gideon has said, I'll not be your king, but I do have one thing. Now, the spoils of the, uh, of the vanquished go to the victor, and there were lots of spoils to be gained from beating this 135,000 strong army. They had brought lots of wealth, lots of riches with them. Look with me in verse 24. In verse 24, when he says, I want the gold, he finishes up and says in verse 25, they look at him and they say, we'll be glad to give them. And so they spread out a garment and each man threw a ring from his plunder onto it. And the weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels, not counting the ornaments, the pendants, the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains, that were on their camel's necks. Now, what we see is they take these beautiful robes, they cast them on the ground, and they push their gold there, and Gideon is wealthy beyond imagination. Seventy pounds of gold are left. And while Gideon is not their king, all of a sudden Gideon has the ability to lead the lifestyle of a king. He's fabulously wealthy. So what does he do? It tells us in the next verses that he takes some of this gold and he melts it down and he makes a gold ephod. Now, what's that? An ephod would be the outer garment that's worn by the high priest as they did their priestly uh, duties in the tabernacle. Why would he do this? Why, why would he create a gold ephod? What's he going to do? Well, we don't really know, but what we do know is this, that it becomes corrupted. That this people who, again, have such a hard time following God, they take this ephod and they make an idol out of it. He displays it in his home. Look with me in verse 27. In verse 27, it says, All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it. Okay, what's it? The ephod there. And it became a snare to Gideon and his family. It became a snare to Gideon and his family. You know, so oftentimes, today even, we take the blessings of God and we don't realize they are from God. We make them of our own making. Our security is of our own making. And we've seen even in these days of shelter in place, who would have dreamed at the turn of the year that we would be in our homes and that if we dared to go out that we'd have to wear a mask? Security's fleeting. And what Gideon does here is he inadvertently creates a snare for the people and they make an idol out of it. 
You know, one of the things I love about our pastor is that when Pastor Jeff came to Park Cities, he made a video and he said, I don't ever want you to point people to me. I want you to point people to Jesus. And what Gideon did is he allowed the victories and the memories of the victories that God had given to be captured in gold and gold of their own hands making an, an ephod. And what happens is that Gideon misses an opportunity to bring religious reformation to the people. He misses the opportunity for revival to break out. You know, in these days, this is an opportunity to pray for God's church all around the world and to pray for God's church at Park Cities to have an awakening and that revival might break out in these days of such great need. As we look at the need in our city, as we look at the need in our nation, only God can meet that need. But Gideon fails this test. He fails the test of money and of power. One last test, a test of retirement. You know, I told you he, he won this victory in his 30s. Okay, he has 40 more years, Scripture tells us. And if you go through here, and I hope that you'll continue reading, you're going to see that there are no more records of godly leadership or exploits in the life of Gideon. You know, Gideon may have turned down the role of king, but not the lifestyle. We read that Gideon takes on many wives, many concubines, 70 sons. He has a son later in life, Abimelech, with a concubine. And that means son of a king. Gideon names him that. And we see in his lifestyle, not the godly younger man that we saw who seek to, sought to follow God. And as a result, we see that Gideon, although he died in peace and prosperity, he died a failure. And so as I think about our lives today, how will we finish? You know, the Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy, he talks about how he had run his race. He had run the course that God had set out for him. What about us? I would encourage each of us during these days, we've talked about these each week, to look at ways to leave a legacy, to build into your family, to build into your children, your grandchildren, to build into your church, all that God has for you in these days. That's the lesson of Gideon, to pass the test of retirement, to follow Jesus every day. What better epitaph could anybody have than to be described at the end of their days that they had been a follower of Christ. Let me pray. Father, as we finish this series, we pray, God, that you'd speak to us. You'd speak to us as to how you would have us to finish. May we finish strong following you, and we, may we do so in the name of Jesus. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we conclude today, what a great promise. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Join with me. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. And the victory is ours through Jesus Christ when we all get to heaven. It'll be a glorious day. God bless you all.